You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our podcast is featured on the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle or me at leadersandlegends.net. And as always, all our podcast interviews are dedicated to the legacy and generosity of P.E. McAllister. Thank you for listening. And joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast, our guest today is Dr. Elizabeth Norton. She is a London-based historian who specializes in the Queens of England and the Tudor period. She has a double first-class degree from the University of Cambridge, a master's degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD from King's College, London. Incredible. She has taught history at King's College London, and I think I got this right, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Yeah, doing the historical side. Professor Norton is a worldwide best-selling author. She boasts 18,000 followers on X. We're going to ask her about her recent uh, adventure that was documented on X. She is also a frequent commentator on British and American public television. And she is this week's guest on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Dr. Norton, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for inviting me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Let's get right to your recent journey. Those of you who follow Professor Norton on X uh, probably had just the most fun, not only with her photos, but her captions for her recent trip to the American Southwest, which, as I'm sure you can tell with her accent, is not necessarily where she's from. Did you have a blast? Yeah, absolutely. It was fabulous. So I was out in Arizona for just over a week, a couple of weeks ago, and had the best time. It was a bit of a it was a bit of a childhood dream for me because we went down to Tombstone, where of course the gunfight at the OK Corral happened, which is just fabulous. And then we headed up and we went to the Grand Canyon, we went to Meteor Crater, went and did a Red Rocks tour of Sedona. So we were properly tourists, which was pretty exciting. Is it you go it seems Americans go over to England quite a bit, obviously. And when Brits, to use that term, come over to the United States, it seems like a lot of them, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, that sort of thing. What made you fly the extra two, two and a half thousand miles to hit the Southwest? Yeah, so I've always wanted to go. I am a bit of a cowboy fan, actually. Cow- old cowboy movies. I really like the movie Tombstone with Val Kilmer, which <laughs> kind of slightly inspired me. I was actually listening to an audio book on Doc Holliday last year and thought, you know what, I'm going to go to Tombstone. So we did. But it's also really, I'm trying, post-COVID, I think I'm trying to see more places in the world that I've always wanted to go to because it feels a bit like there's all these places that I've said I'd like to go to. Um, but I've never got round to going to. So now I'm trying to do that a bit more. So Tombstone and the Grand Canyon were very much on that list. But I also, I really love the US. I, I'm, it's a great country. And actually, I find the best way to experience the US is to get out there in a car and kind of drive around and try and stay a bit off the beaten track. And actually, we didn't hear any other British accents at all while we were in Arizona, which surprised me a bit in that it's the Grand Canyon. <laughs> How were you treated when people heard you and your family speak? Did they go, oh, where are you from? Yeah, yeah. I think generally the British accent's quite popular in the US. So the kids got quite a lot of quite a lot of love and they opened their mouths, <laughs> which was nice. What other before we move on, what other 
old west movies do you enjoy watching see i like i yeah i like them all i, I like the old ones with clint eastwood and um, we again we're watching um, did you say the old ones did yeah. you say the old ones with clint eastwood <laughs> they're, old. they're quite old they're older than Tombstone. yeah yeah when I was a kid I used to watch the movies with my dad and also some of the old John Wayne ones as well in fact in the motel we stayed in Tombstone that was the one that John Wayne used to stay in when he was filming so oh, that was really? quite exciting well, Monument Valley um, yeah yeah so down that way but there was a John Wayne room and apparently had a barbecue built um for him while he was there and things <laughs> like that so that was quite exciting The Searchers is the movie if you've not seen The Searchers, I'm guessing you have. That is yeah. universally acclaimed. Uh, but there are so many during that time period. It, is there? Is there, there are, a, go ahead. And it's a shame they don't really make them so much anymore. There are a few, but in the age of the Western is very much gone, I would say. Unforgiven is a beautiful movie, which I'm sure you've seen. Is there an equivalent? Is there a British equivalent? If not, obviously not in geography, but in terms of remoteness, and culture and it's not of a late discovery but a later discovery is there an english or british equivalent to the southwest probably not when we when arizona te territory was being settled from the east um in england we we're all kind of living in in cities wearing corsets and things so i think it was it's there isn't exactly in england it's particularly england it's quite built up you can't really walk you can't really get lost in the same way that you can in the woods in the US, for example. If you're in England, if you get lost in the woods, you're going to come to a road in a couple of miles or a house. Scotland really is the only part of the British Isles of, of Great Britain that you have some sort of equivalency in, in the remoteness and the fact that you can drive and not see anyone or you can walk out into the woods and not see anyone. But certainly when you go down into the south, it's very built up. It's very different. You are listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is historian and author, Dr. Elizabeth Norton. She just returned from a trip to the American Southwest. Look her up on her Twitter feed, her X feed, if you want to see the pictures. And the, the captions are funny. It was a great visit to watch unfold. There seems to be, if there's one British dynasty or royal house that never loses favor or never loses attention, it's the Tudors. We've had several Tudor historians on. They've all been terrific. They're all your friends, so I won't go through all the names. What drew you to the Tudor period? So for me, what I really like about it, it's the first period in British history, at least, where you can start to see inside people's heads because I really like to see how people work and what they're thinking of the of, of life and um, in the medieval period we've got we do have letters but they don't tend to be personal letters so they're very much Eleanor by the grace of God Queen of England but not very not personal letters and the Tudor period we're still they're still quite scant the sources we don't have the secret diary of Henry VIII unfortunately which would be great if it did exist some of his wives we don't have personal letters for, but we're getting a lot more of a sense of them as individuals. And that's what I really like. And it's also an era of such big personalities. Henry VIII is probably, arguably, I think, the most recognisable monarch worldwide, apart from probably Elizabeth II. He's a big character. And there's so much change in the period as well. We've got the Reformation. We've got the rise of female monarchy, and I think that's really important, with particularly Elizabeth I really showing that a woman can wear the crown and can do a good job of it. There is a question I'm going to ask you later on, but I will preview it now, so I'll give you time to think. <laughs> One of my questions is, who is who is the most overrated person in British history? Oh. And I'll let you stew on that by giving you uh, Professor Susanna Lipscomb's answer, and that is Elizabeth I. I can I've see that. I can see that. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, we she she is probably she's underrated for propaganda. She is a master at propaganda. She's probably one of the best sort of people are really getting themselves out there ever. And we still view Elizabeth through the prism of her propaganda. We've got the Virgin Queen, we've got Gloriana, but even just daily life, we see Elizabeth, she wanted us to see her. So she's this really quite goddess-like figure, never wrong, very powerful, very strong. There are negatives in her reign. 
she's awful to Catholics. She makes Catholicism illegal. You cannot worship as a Catholic in England, and there are increasingly harsh penalties. Margaret Clitheroe, for example, is pressed to death under stones in York, really just for being a Catholic. The 1590s as well are a bit of a disaster for England. And there's economic crisis, the harvests fail, there's a lot of hunger, there's plague, there's war in Ireland and in the Netherlands, which arguably Elizabeth has to some extent mishandled, particularly Ireland. So I think, you know, actually, there are a lot of negatives about Elizabeth's reign. I certainly wouldn't say I wouldn't agree with Susanna that she's the most overrated person, because I think actually the positives do outweigh the negatives with Elizabeth. And actually, she does reign successfully for more than 40 years. She's the longest reigning Tudor monarch. She's the longest reigning monarch for a really long time. The longest reigning monarch at that stage who comes to the throne as an adult as well. And she does leave a more stable and prosperous country than she inherited. So I think I I disagree with Susanna, although um, <laughs> she's a very dear friend. But so I respectfully disagree with her. But I do think I do agree that there are negatives about Elizabeth and the sort of somewhat saintly view of, of her we have doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. Is it fair to say that Henry Tudor um, tried to bring order out of chaos Wars of the Roses. It's the most complicated thing I've ever tried to read through. I still get confused. Doesn't matter. And I feel better about my confusion with regard to the Wars of the Roses because my medieval history thesis director says he doesn't understand them either. Yeah. (laughs) So what what is it about Henry VII that brought the order after the Wars of the Roses? 1485, Bosworth, he wins. Why is that such a dividing line in British history? So partly it's luck. It's lucky for him that Richard III is killed in the battle, because if Richard had lived to fight another day, we might still be talking about the Yorkist dynasty now or the Plantagenets, because Richard is really the last certain contender for the throne from the House of York, apart from the Earl of Warwick, but he's in Henry's power and will eventually be executed by him. So I think it's partly luck. I think also a great deal to do with Henry's personality. He's really scary. His nobility are clearly frightened of Henry VII. He promotes a lot of new men, so bypasses the traditional nobility. And really, he does reign to some extent with terror. Um, people are scared of him. He imposes these huge loans. Actually, one one awful thing he does is he dates the first day of his reign to the day before Bosworth Field. And what that means is that anyone who fought for Richard at Bosworth Field mm-hmm. is automatically a traitor, which is awful when you think that at, at that stage he was the king of England. But that's the sort of thing Henry VII did. He... he knows exactly what's going on everywhere. He's got spies around every corner. It's not a particularly happy time for England, I would say. He's a very strong ruler. And personally, a a really interesting character. He very much brings order out of chaos, but I think it is at the cost of his popularity. People don't like him very much. And it's also, to some extent, at the cost of the power of the nobility. But that's um, arguably quite a good thing, really. Is it fair to say you mentioned luck, but if someone was to term Henry VII's ascension to the throne a miracle, how accurate would that be? It's ridiculous that he becomes (laughs) king. He's got a terrible claim to the throne. So he claims through three titles, through hereditary right, through conquest, so in battle, and through marriage. His hereditary title is just ridiculous. He claims through his mother, who is the Beaufort heiress. And the Beauforts are the children born to John of Gaunt, who is the third son of Edward III, to John of Gaunt's third marriage to Catherine Swinford. So all looks fine, except for the fact that all of their adult children, the Beauforts, actually attend their wedding. So they are very much illegitimate. They are legitimated by their parents' marriage. John is able to secure the Pope's agreement they're legitimated, but actually it's pretty dubious. There is legitimate and there's legitimate, if you like. Clearly, the Tudors shouldn't have been anywhere near the throne. A lot of it is down to what happens in 1483 with the disappearance of the prince in the tower and Richard III's accession to the throne, which is controversial. So that plays into Henry's hands. His second title is through battle, so through conquest, in the same way that William the Conqueror claimed the English crown. It's quite a good title. Obviously, it does mean that someone else may come along and try and conquer England after you. 
And his third title, and this is one he didn't like, but it's actually his strongest, is through marriage. And that's his marriage to Elizabeth of York, who is the eldest daughter of Edward IV, and so the sister of the prince in the tower. So provided that you think that she's legitimate, and most people do in the period, then actually it's a really strong title because nobody has a better hereditary claim than Elizabeth. I was just getting ready to ask that. Isn't it true that of of the couple, she should have been Queen Regnant and he should have been Prince Consort? Yeah, absolutely. She's undoubtedly got a far superior claim to him. But actually, if you look at the English family tree, and it gets really complex in this period, she is the one with the absolute best claim in the entire country. So yeah, she should have been a reigning queen, but there hadn't been a successful reigning queen. There there was one claimant in the 12th century. Mm. Other than that, no woman has claimed the English crown. It's definitely the case that a woman can pass on her claim to her children. And that's well established in English precedent. But it wasn't quite so clear whether you could have a reigning queen. But yeah, absolutely. He should have been the prince consort or the king consort. Empress Matilda being the first example of passing through, of whose her son is becomes the, the famous Henry II uh, through yeah, absolutely. Dad, and, and of Henry course, King Stephen. King Stephen as well, who takes the throne from Matilda, also claims through a woman, through his mother Adele. So it's pretty much established in England that you can, it's completely established in England that you can claim through a woman, which is where the Wars of the Roses come in, because of course the Lancastrian kings are only descended from the third son of Edward III, but the House of York are descended through the second son, through some women. And that's really where the problem comes. Is that Richard Plantagenet? Yeah, yeah. So he is, he's descended from the second son through um, Lionel of Antwerp, through um, his daughter Philippa, and then some others, and then um, Anne Mortimer. So it's a, it's not a direct male line claim in the same way that the Lancastrians have. Um, but it's the better hereditary claim as far as the English crown is concerned. We cannot, I don't know if, if letting you off the hook is the right phrase. So forgive me. There has been in the last few months, I think it's in the last few months, a new book about the princes in the tower, their fate and the mystery surrounding them. Do you come down? I don't want, I'm looking around to make sure the Richard III Society doesn't have me (laughs) under surveillance. Do you come down one way or the other on who murdered the princes? So I actually appeared in the documentary that goes with that. So I'm not going to be, I don't always agree with all of the conclusions, but I think it was an interesting documentary and an interesting book. And I just want to caveat this because I know that (laughs) Richard III society can be a little bit scary. Uh, Of the two people fighting at Bosworth Field, Richard III has definitely got the best claim to the throne and always say that. Yes. So I thought the information that Philippa Langley dug up was quite interesting about the prince in the tower. It's definitely food for thought. I don't think, and I've said this to her, I don't think she's quite proved her case. For example, the sort of key document which suggests that Perkin Warbeck may have been Richard Duke of York. I think everyone agrees that it is a 15th century document, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was written by Richard Duke of York just because it says it was. And I think we need more evidence. My view remains that the princes was would have died in the tower. And I think there are really only two candidates to have killed them because they're such high profile prisoners. In 1483, it's Richard III. If they're still alive in 1485, it's Henry VII. And I think Henry VII would undoubtedly have killed the princes if he'd arrived at the tower and they'd been there. But my view from my reading of the sources is I would highly, strongly believe they were already dead by that point. Isn't there another theory that, and it just popped in my head, is it Henry VII? Seventh mother that a woman had them killed. Who is that? Am I recalling this correct? So this one really annoys me. I try not to get. I try not to be too partial when I'm dealing with history because people don't really want to know what I think. It's got to be based on the sources. But the idea that Margaret Beaufort killed the prince in the tower is absolute rubbish. I'm going to throw that one out there. Actually, Margaret Beaufort was quite a sweet woman. She doesn't necessarily come across like that in her portraits, and she could be quite domineering. But actually. Everyone that knew her seems to have loved her and really loved her. Henry Morley, who'd been a page in her household as a boy, later wrote a book about how wonderful she was. John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, her executor, again sung her praises. People really loved her. She does seem to have been quite a kind figure. The idea that she killed the prince in the tower, it's the only source is a very dubious 17th century source that claims that she killed them. Otherwise, there's nothing at all, nothing contemporary. It really comes from Philippa Gregory's novel, The Red Queen, which states that 
Margaret killed the princes. And since then, it's really become a bit of a juggernaut. And now she's become a real contender to have killed the princes. But there's just nothing at all to suggest. In fact, she actually tried to rescue them. She was involved in a plot on Richard's coronation day to free the princes from the tower, which again, I think suggests that it's not Margaret. Is there a parallel between the drive to put Margaret as the chief culprit in the murders as there was or is perhaps to make Prince Eddie grandson of Queen Victoria, Jack the Ripper? Yeah, everyone likes a royal scandal or sort of a royal. Yeah, I agree. Eddie, again, slightly unusual character, and it's really become target. But there's no evidence at all that Eddie was Jack the Ripper. And in fact, his fiance, who later marries his brother, actually, and they always spoke quite fondly of him in later years, and his family seemed to have genuinely loved him. So I think, yeah, I think there is an element of that with Margaret. I also always think Margaret's portrait, she always looks very severe. She's always dressed in a quite nun-like habit. She's somewhat the female equivalent of Henry VII, her son. She's not pretty. And I always think that potentially pushes people down the maybe she is a murderer line. And I think that's really unfair, but I think women do tend to be judged on their appearances quite a bit. And I think we can possibly see that with Margaret. You are listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Professor Elizabeth Norton. She's a best-selling author. I'm going to read some of the books that she's read off the titles of some of the books. She Wolves, The Notorious Queens of England, which I've read and is terrific. Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's Obsession. Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's True Love. Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII's Discarded Bride. <laughs> Catherine Parr. And let's do a couple of others. Uh, the Boleyn Women and the Hidden Lives of Tudor Women, A Social History. What was your reaction, uh, Dr. Norton, when you heard the news that Richard III's bones had been discovered in a car park? Uh, it's a stunning discovery. Just in, in, normally, when, so I actually did an archaeology degree. And when you're an archaeologist, you never find the things you're actually looking for. If someone goes looking for <laughs> a specific thing, you never, I used to find cow bones all the time, which isn't terribly interesting. But you never actually find the thing you're looking for. You often find other things, but to find a specific individual is, is insane. So it's absolutely just a stunning achievement. It's the archaeological find of the 21st century so far. I would say. For me, it's up there with Tutankhamun's tomb. It's just fascinating. It's They found him on the very first day of the dig, I think. Um, I remember it being announced and it's just unbelievably true, unbelievably fascinating. It's great to be able to look at his face with the facial reconstruction. And it's also really good that he's been given a, a royal burial in Leicester Cathedral. I was quite pleased he went to Leicester too. There was quite a lot of controversy over York or Leicester. And although he didn't really have any connection to Leicester, he had been there a really long time by that stage. So I felt it was appropriate. Did the discovery of his skeleton answer more questions than it asked? I think the scoliosis is really interesting. So that's mm -hmm. the curvature to his spine, because of course, Tudor sources make a great deal about the fact that Richard is a hunchback. He's misshapen, to use a contemporary term. Clearly, he, to some extent, he was, because it would be a massive coincidence to smear someone as a hunchback and actually to then find that they do have the curvature to their spine. So clearly it was noticeable to some extent, but I think we can discount the, the Shakespearean Richard hobbling around on the stage. This is a man that could fight in armour and could fight in battle. But I thought that was really interesting, actually. And I think it's quite important. It shows a disabled man to some extent, able to take a very active role in, in the politics and the period of the time. So I think that's quite interesting. For me, actually seeing his face was really interesting. And I, Skull reconstructions are always a bit tricky because you have to guesstimate to some extent thickness of um, tissues and things like that. But it was interesting to get a sense of what he really looked like because a lot of his portraits are later. Um, and there is the argument, of course, that they've been doctored. Do you, if you believe, and you not necessarily being, meaning you, Dr. Norton, but if one believes that Richard III killed his nephews in the tower, why does he deserve a royal burial? Partly, a lot of kings do bad things. His brother, Edward IV, of course, ordered their brother, George of Clarence, to be executed. If you want to be a successful medieval monarch, you have to do bad things. I would argue that if you want to be a successful medieval monarch 
who's have taken the throne from someone else, killing them is quite a good idea. His brother didn't <laughs> kill Henry VI, and Henry VI then came back to the throne for a bit. Uh, different standards, I think. I think it's really significant that he was a monarch. He was a king. There are a few other lost kings, actually. I mean, they're always looking for Alfred the Great. I and mean, Henry right. I, I think, is buried somewhere under the ruins of Reading Abbey, but no one's ever found him. But I think, you know, if we look at the records of any British monarchs, they've all done fairly awful things at times, often with some justification, often without justification. But I think really we can't necessarily say that he's much worse or any worse than some of the things the other monarchs have done. Henry VII, for example, had the Earl of Warwick, who was just a young man, judicially murdered, effectively he had him executed. So I think I think Richard deserves it as much as any of the other monarchs of the period. Note for the record, maybe we'll have another podcast. Henry the First is my favorite. English king. And on my list of the most underrated people in history. Listening He's to your, fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Listening to your documentaries and reading your blogs and your articles and following you on X. Uh, it seems to me that I'm going to I'm going to say that you've said something that you haven't said. This is what we do on the podcast. We put pe- word in people's mouths. Uh, are the Tudors the dynasty most responsible for shaping Great Britain's national identity, its sense of Englishness and and Britishness? And if so, why? And if not, whom would you choose? Interesting. So really, in many respects, they're nothing to do with shaping Britishness and that they're the last gasp of England as an independent country. So, of course, James VI of Scots becomes king in 1603 and unites the crowns. So in many respects, they don't shape British identity at all. However, I think they do. English identity has been quite dominant in Britain since the Union of the Crowns. I think that's probably uncontroversial, possibly unpopular, but uncontroversial. The Reformation creates the Church of England with Elizabeth's 1559 religious settlement. We get what becomes the Church of England, which has endured to this day. And I think that's been very a major factor in shaping British identity over the centuries. So I think, yes, I think it is quite important. However, I think the most important figure, and a figure who's quite underrated, actually, but I think the most important figure for creating the British identity has got to be James VI and I. Um, So Mary, Queen of Scots' son, who becomes King of Scots as an infant and then King of England in 1603. And he's quite an unpopular figure in Ireland. Um, But in Britain, he's actually, I think he's a really important figure. He's the first person who wants to... He doesn't want to just unite the crowns. He wants to create the Kingdom of Britain. He doesn't actually succeed in that. takes another century. But he certainly is the one that brings England and Scotland and Wales, of course, together. Because before that, Scotland, Scottish people to the English were entirely foreign and and vice versa. It was a different, entirely different place. It would be like going to France. For an English person in the 16th century, the English people are quite scared of the Scots at times and vice versa again. So actually he brings them together and eventually creates the British identity. So I think James is really important and really underrated. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, speaking of the Irish, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our guest today is Professor Elizabeth Norton. She's a London-based historian specializing in the Tudor period and England's great queens. Dr. Norton, if you were asked would you have signed Anne Boleyn's death warrant? No, she's not guilty. So no, I might have done if I was going to get executed if I didn't. <laughs> but I'm not Chances sure I'd like to that much. Yeah. <laughs> but no, she obviously is not guilty. The charges are just they don't they make no sense. They're quite specific. So they'll say things, and I'm totally paraphrasing here, but they'll say things like on the 31st of December at Richmond Palace, you did allure your brother with your tongue in his mouth, or something like that. And it'll turn out that Anne wasn't at Richmond that day and her brother was in France or something like that. She's obviously accused of adultery with five men, one of whom is her own brother. It's just, yeah, the there's clearly 
quite a lot of flirtation going on in her household. She's perhaps been a little bit unwise with some of the conversations she's had with these men. And she actually recounts these conversations herself. But it's clear she hasn't committed adultery because actually queens are never alone. So the fact that there's no female accomplice arrested with her, as there is with Catherine Howard, Henry's fifth wife, who's also arrested for adultery, it really suggests that Anne didn't do it. And she swears her own innocence on the sacrament, which for a woman who's about to meet her maker is a pretty serious thing to do. Mm. So, no, as long as I was totally free from having any repercussions, I wouldn't have signed her death warrant. Would you have signed Catherine Howard's? No, I feel really sorry for Catherine Howard. No, I wouldn't. She she certainly wasn't a virgin when she married the king and probably should have disclosed that. I probably would have done if I was her. Uh, she is probably guilty of adultery with Thomas Culpepper. If she's not, it looks really bad. She was meeting with Thomas Culpepper in secret at night. Her lady-in-waiting was letting him in. She looks really guilty. But I still wouldn't have signed her death warrant. She's not even 20 at the time of her fall. And really, I always think she's Henry VIII's midlife crisis. It was his fault for marrying. (laughs) Would you have signed Mary Queen of Scots' death warrant? Oh, that's a tricky one. I can see why Mary was conspiring against Elizabeth. I would conspire against Elizabeth if I was Mary, because there's <laughs> she's clearly the next heir to the throne. I think actually, had Elizabeth died during Mary's imprisonment, the most likely outcome is Mary would have become queen and then probably invaded Scotland. So I think <laughs> it's in her interest that Elizabeth should die. And Elizabeth's also keeping her a prisoner. She's had no trial. Um for years and years and wasting her youth. So I can totally see why Mary does it. She's clearly quite guilty. The Babington plot, she's pretty much caught red-handed. May I ask, I mean, though, this is a, this is a, let me just say very quickly, this is a point that Dr. Lipscomb made, I think, is Dr. Lipscomb. She was executed for treason. Mm. But she's not English. She's not an English subject. So how could she be executed for treason? Mm, It's a good point. She's not an English subject. So probably can't be executed, can't really be guilty of treason. Equally, Charles I in the 17th century is executed for treason. And of course, treason is a crime against the king and he is the king. So again, he probably wasn't guilty of treason either. (laughs) Yeah. Are you signing Mary's death warrant? I probably wouldn't. I probably would have kept her in prison, I think, if I was Elizabeth, partly because her death sparks the Spanish Armada. It creates a martyr narrative for Mary, which Elizabeth probably didn't want. So, no, I probably would have kept Mary alive if I was Elizabeth. Also, to use her as an alternative candidate to James, James starts to get a bit ambitious or a bit independent. You can always say, maybe your mother might want to be queen after me. It's If you kill someone, then they stop being an option. So, no, I probably wouldn't have killed Mary either. Of the three you've said, she's definitely the most guilty, although there is a bit of a technicality on whether or not she can be guilty of treason. I read this uh, terrific book by a, a brilliant scholar, and she's was a wonderful, funny podcast guest, and that's Dr. Nicola Tallis, who I'm sure would yeah, you have Nicholas signed? It, she's so funny. It was a great interview. Uh, may I ask, would you have signed Lady Jane Grey's death warrant? No, she's also not guilty. And Nicola, of course, goes into this a lot in her book, obviously. But no, Jane is very much a puppet. Even Mary I didn't think Jane was guilty. I promised to spare her life. And it's only following Wyatt's rebellion the following year that Jane really becomes too dangerous to leave alive because she's been proclaimed queen. Um, And the legality of Edward VI's device for succession, which places Jane on the throne, is pretty dubious anyway, because he's a minor. He can't actually make changes to the succession. He can't really do anything until he reaches his majority. But no, Jane is clearly not guilty. The problem is what do you do with her? Because she's really too dangerous ever to be allowed out or to get married or to have children. Really, I think her future was one of incarceration, a little bit like Mary, Queen of Scots, had she not been executed. But of course, that's preferable to having your head chopped off. I agree. I get asked quite a bit why I don't read fiction. And it's a failing of mine, and I I fully and freely admit it. But usually my uh, answer is, well, if I want to read about romance and intrigue and betrayal and wars, I'll just read a book about the Tudors. Yeah. Am I far off there? 
No, I think they've got it all really as a dynasty. You don't need fiction with the Tudors. The, the truth is somewhat stranger than fiction. Is it fair to say that the Tudor dynasty marks a bit of a break from from the centuries long connection to France and French ways? Yeah, they are they're not French in any way. I mean the extent that the first post conquest English king to speak English as his first language is Henry V in the 15th century. Before that, French is their first language. Henry VII, Henry VIII, they're very far removed from the sort of the Francophile kings. Henry VII is slightly different because he's raised, he spends a lot of his time, his teenage years, his early adulthood in Brittany and then France. But they certainly don't view themselves as a French dynasty in the way that Edward III probably did. Edward I to some extent, Henry II certainly. And um, so I think in that sense, they are a departure. They obviously all still speak French. It's an important diplomatic mar- language. There's often talk of marriages with France as well. Henry VIII's sister, of course, marries Louis XII of France. And there's often talk of French marriages for many of them, particularly Elizabeth I with the Duke of Anjou or Alençon. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think they are very much the first absolutely English dynasty. There's no question that they're an English dynasty. Elizabeth I, Mary I. Edward the Sixth, they never even leave England. That's just where they are. They don't even go to France. If you could have anyone from the Tudor period on X, other than William Shakespeare, whom would you choose? I'm going to go with Henry VIII. I think it'd be interesting. <laughs> He's a controversial character. Yeah, I think he'd be quite outspoken on X. He'd probably quite enjoy it, I think, really putting across his point of view. But it would be never boring to listen to Henry tweeting away. We talked a few minutes ago about imposters and whether it's Herc and Warbuck or Herbeck and some of the other ones. Um, there's a lot of folks who assert William Shakespeare is not one person. Do you have an opinion on that? controversy or historical archaeological dig yeah it's not something i've hugely looked into from my sort of reading of everything i i don't see it really he may be a glover's son from stratford but he seems to have had quite a good education i believe he goes to the grammar school there and i think there's no reason why they're not they can't be the product of one person and why that can't be him. I know Christopher Marlowe, for example, who dies in a tavern brawl, has been suggested to have actually continued living and to become Shakespeare. But actually, I think Shakespeare's plays are better than Marlowe's. And Marlowe's are very good, but Shakespeare, of course, is on another level. So it also involves Marlowe also improving in his posthumous period. And there are other suggestions as well. I think the Earl of Southampton is another suggested Shakespeare so it's an interesting idea. I just I think there's no reason to doubt that it is Shakespeare and that I think people can often come from relatively humble backgrounds to go on and do remarkable things. And I think he's such a genius. His plays, have, they are the best work in of English literature ever written they're right up there with the right up there with Homer and of works of literature and I think actually there's no reason why they can't have been a genius born in Stratford who went to the local school and, and was able to do that so I think as far as I'm concerned it, it is Shakespeare but I'm happy to be proved wrong if you could go back in time and box the years of someone in English or British history whom would you choose oh there's so many <laughs> I should I exclude Henry yeah. VIII? <laughs> if, if I were going back really far, I want to go and tell King Harold to not rush down from Stamford Bridge Stanford in the north Bridge. to go and meet William of the Normandy and give himself some time to get his army up to speed and to recover. That would be very different. We'd all be called Elfgifu and Ed- Edwy. Um, <laughs> Wolfwe. I wrote a paper yeah. in graduate school about a medieval beekeeper. His name was Wolfwe. Yes. <laughs> Anglo-Saxon names are great. What I would say with Anglo-Saxon names, of course, is when Emma of Normandy came to England to marry Ethelred yeah. the Unready, mm-hmm. the English went, oh, Emma, that's a weird name. We're going to call you Elfgifu. <laughs> that's a great book. Uh, I forget who wrote it. Queen Emma and the Four Kings. It's a terrific book. Yeah. Fascinating. She's just fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have a chat to Queen Emma. But no, there are so many events. It's just fascinating. I'd like to go back, chat to some of Henry VIII's wives with Anne Boleyn, maybe say, be a bit careful and maybe have a chaperone and be a bit less outspoken around, around the king. Jane Seymour, I'd like to give her a big box of antibiotics. 
Um, yes. But I think there are so many there are so many moments, and alternative history is so fascinating. What if Mary the First had gone on to have a son instead of her phantom pregnancy? What would have happened mm. then? What would well, have happened me, if Elizabeth the First had married? It's fascinating. Let me ask you um, a counterfactual. I was on a history TV show here in Indianapolis. It's probably been ten years ago now. And they came up with different categories, so we could come up with our own answers. And one of the categories for a show was, what are history's most impactful premature deaths? So what would you rank as the most impactful premature death in English-British history? Oh, that's interesting. That's hard. Uh, I think, was it Nicola? No, I think it might have been Tracy Borman. Dr. Borman said, who, that sounds like a book. Yeah. Said, yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with King Harold again, the arrow in the eye or not um, at Hastings, because that changed English history forever. We're still, of course, un- still ruled by the descendants mm-hmm. of the Norman kings. If Harold hadn't died on the battlefield, who knows what have, would have happened again? We'd all be called Wolf North. But I think otherwise, I think... What about if we Arthur go to Tudor? The Tudors, yeah, again, yeah. If we go to the Tudors or Henry VIII's eldest son by Catherine of Aragon, Henry, he died. he's born on New Year's Day in 1511 and then dies a few months later. But had he lived, we wouldn't have had the Reformation as we had it because Henry would have had no reason to try to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. We probably would have still had a Protestant Reformation, I think. The Netherlands, for example, mm-hmm. which is very close to the, to England, always, always through history. They, of course, have a more grassroots Reformation. And I think we would probably see that in England. But everything would have played out very differently. We'd have had no Mary I. She probably would have been born, but not Queen. No Edward VI, no Elizabeth I. It would be a very different world. And Henry VIII would be remembered as a much more boring monarch, I think. He'd probably he'd be remembered for just having one wife instead of six. What about William Atheling? Yeah, that's another one with the white ship. So another major turning point in English history, because, of course, he dies in the wreck of the white ship. He's the only son of, I think it's in 1120. He's the only legitimate son of Henry I. Henry I, of course, has millions of illegitimate sons, but only one legitimate son. And with his death, um, Henry hurriedly remarries, but doesn't produce any more legitimate children, which means his heiress is his daughter, Empress Matilda. Um, So he tries to pass the throne to her, but it doesn't really work out. Um, His nephew, King Stephen, snatches the throne, and Matilda then vies for the throne, um, comes very close, but doesn't quite manage it, but her son succeeds. I think William's death is very, it does change history to a great extent. The extent varies. Had If he... What if he didn't have children? Then his heir probably would have been Henry II anyway. So I'm not sure quite how big a turning point it is, but it was a major disaster for English royal history. I love the nickname given to that historic historical period, the Anarchy. It's a yes. terrific name. <laughs> it's fun to remember. Sums when, it up, I think. <laughs> uh, much to my kids' initial horror, but eventual delight, I bought all of the DVDs um, for CAD file, and we ended up loving oh, the CAD file mystery series. I love CAD file. Um, so good. I just, yeah, I adore it. What really annoys me though is that he's pro Stephen. He is pro Stephen. <laughs> I like Matilda myself. I'm not very fond of Stephen. So, no, that's the only thing. I mean, CAD file is such a sweetheart played by Derek Jacobi, oh. but it's a pro Stephen thing. I'm always a bit like, no, CAD file. You definitely be from Matilda. <laughs> Let me give you one more and then we'll move on. Prince Henry the son of King James I. Yes. So he is obviously the more popular, more charismatic elder brother of Charles I. Uh, The Civil War has been brewing for a while. Elizabeth never entirely gets, really gets uniformity in her church. She tries to. James VI also doesn't entirely, it's a difficult situation. However, Elizabeth and James are both quite good at keeping the Puritans within the Church of England. They might grumble quite a lot inside the Church of England, but they largely stay inside. Charles alienates them really by introducing some quite severe changes to the church um, under Archbishop Lord. And that really does 
kickstart the civil war. I would suspect that Henry would be more diplomatic than Charles. He's certainly more popular and seems to be more politically adept. So I think it's possible he could have held everything together and that we wouldn't have had the civil war or the war of the three kingdoms at the point that we do with his brother Charles. So I think it's possible we may have avoided it altogether. Equally, it may have just kicked the can down the road and it may have been Prince Henry's less charismatic son, or his grandson, that then ended up with the civil war and parliament beheading the king. But I think Henry was a better option than Charles for keeping the, the kingdoms unified. And there are lots of others we could mention, of course, and that's Henry V, uh, the premature death of Edward the Black Prince, Frederick, Prince of Wales who is the son of George II and the father of George III, who is our favorite king for lots of good reasons over here. He's fabulous in Hamilton. (laughs) (laughs) I've read a couple biographies with him, but he's a very underrated figure. That's for sure. George III, even though I have to say in this little piece of British snobbishness, that's that the word, condescension. The movie, The Madness of King George, here in the States. In England, it was just called, in Britain, it was just called George the Third. The British film distributors changed the title upon its release in the United States because they thought Americans would think it was a sequel. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite English history movie? Ah, ooh. And can, not exactly, can you divorce it's not, yourself? Excuse me, just real quick. Can you divorce yourself as a historian while you watch it? I remember Susanna Lipscomb saying it was very it's very difficult for her to watch a movie about her particular time period and not just pick it apart. Yeah, so it is quite difficult. You watch anything, this is this didn't happen. It's a bit annoying. So sometimes I steer a bit clear of some of the series or some of the movies, actually. If it's a period I don't know that much about, I'm fine. I'm just, yeah, that's great. But if it's a Tudor, it's always a bit iffy. Shameless plug, Firebrand is a movie about Catherine Parr, which is coming out later this year. I was actually the historical consultant on Firebrand, and I actually watched it a preview before Christmas, and that's excellent. That's definitely my favourite. But it's actually very... It is actually very, it's very well done, even if I do say so myself, and I played quite a minor role. But otherwise, my favourite thing isn't actually a movie, it's more. It's a TV show, and it's Elizabeth R., which was broadcast by the BBC in the 1970s, starring Glenda Jackson. And it's quite low budget, the sets are a bit wobbly, everything seems to take place in about two different rooms in a palace, but it's just fabulous. And Glenda Jackson, for me, really is Elizabeth I. And if I were to go back in a time machine and meet Elizabeth and she wasn't effectively Glenda Jackson, I'd be a bit disappointed. <laughs> If you could solve one mystery in English or British history, which one would you solve? This is your, put your archaeological hat on as well. I think it would have to be the princes in the tower. (laughs) Just, it would be nice to draw a line under that one, really. It'd be nice to know, although I'm not sure everyone would believe me. I don't know what the evidence would be like. But (laughs) yeah, I think probably the princes in the tower. Is there another British, just to very quickly, is there another mystery, obviously, Let's say there's not any one of that level. And famously, Queen Elizabeth refused to have any testing done on the two skeletons that were found, I think, in the tower. The thought is Charles III, the present king, will allow this. Would you be in favor of this testing? Yeah, I would. I think it would be a good thing to do. It'd be nice to know who they are. And it should be, as providing they can extract the DNA, it should be relatively easy because they'll have the same Y chromosome as Richard III, of course, because he's their uncle, paternal uncle. Providing that the rumours about Edward IV being the son, their father being the son of a French archer aren't true, then they should be fairly easy to match. I think it would be good to know who they are. It won't prove who killed them, however, because you can't age bones precisely enough to either their ages in 1483 or their ages in 1485 when it's most the two points where they're most likely to have died. So it still won't prove anything, but it will at least prove who they are. And there's a lot of debate over are they older than the prince of are they possibly even Iron Age? And it would be good to know who they are. And I think whoever they are, they should probably remain in Westminster Abbey. But it would be really good to know if they are the princes, and they might be. 
Whom do you consider the greatest martyr of the Tudor period? Or maybe English history in general. There just appears to be so many. My favorite is Thomas Beckett. But do you have one who's who you think whose martyrdom re- really made a difference in history? Oh, that's interesting. My personal favorite is somewhat obscure. And it's Arch- Archbishop Elfie of Canterbury, who's captured by the Vikings at the start of the 11th century and refuses to be ransomed. He says, no, I don't want you to pay a ransom for me. God will provide for me. Um, One day the Vikings get drunk and they pelt him to death with chicken bones. So he's really the sort of the earlier martyred Archbishop of Canterbury. But I just think he's fascinating. And it's a real testament to just What a low period the reign of Ethelred the Unready is in English history. His nickname, the Unready, isn't very fair. It's a it's a pun that's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Ethelred Unread, which means noble council, Mm -hmm. no council, no council. Um, (laughs) But it's still implying he's a bit stupid. But it's it's clearly quite a low point in English history. It's when the Vikings really step up their attacks. He actually at one stage flees from England rather than to face the Vikings, only to come back when the Viking leader dies. But I think the murder of the Archbishop, who's a much more sort of principled figure than Ethelred, really does. I think it's quite, it's a story that should be better known. I think it's quite a powerful story. It's one of both resistance. And it's also quite interesting because, of course, he gets pelted to death with chicken bones. Must have been some pretty big chickens you had back then, back in the day. Uh, Who do you consider, I alluded to this when we started the podcast, who, who would you consider the most overrated and most underrated person in English, British history? Hey, most overrated. I am going to go with Henry V. And I think his reputation has undergone quite a big turnaround in recent The reason I, I think in his day, he was a huge hero. Shakespeare very much makes Henry V this mighty warrior. He makes him a lot more charismatic than the real Henry V was, because I think the real Henry V was quite a difficult character, probably not someone you necessarily want to be friends with. I think he's very much a man of his time. His major achievement is, of course, very nearly conquering France. But actually, the cost of that is enormous he has to it's right. so expensive to, to mount this campaign of conquest and actually what did he actually achieve in the long term and partly it's, it's not his fault that he died but i think even if he hadn't died he probably couldn't have maintained his conquest because it's one thing to conquer a kingdom but to actually maintain it long term that's much much more difficult and i think even if he hadn't died we would have seen the loss of english held france the hundred years war achieved nothing And I think really he comes in later in the period, but I think really he is overrated because actually his achievements lasted mere years. Speaking of premature deaths, he dies. He dies. And then obviously Charles the sixth, who the French King who was mad Charles the sixth, isn't that right? Yeah. Who thought he was glass and couldn't be touched or he would shattered. He would shatter. But then you have his son who, Became a much bigger king, and then, of course, throw in the mix is the astounding Joan of Arc. Yes. Most underrated. Who deserves a, a re- his or her due? Underrated. So I've already said James the Sixth. So I'm not going to say him again. But I think he is underrated, albeit he's very unpopular in Ireland. Most underrated. <laughs> you can say Neville Chamberlain. Doesn't matter any period. Yeah, I'm not going to say Neville Chamberlain though. <laughs> I think there are so many. I'm going to say, I'm going to say Queen Anne. So she is the last monarch of the Stuart dynasty. Reigns at the start of the 18th century. She is, of course, the queen from the favourite. But I think she is quite underrated as a monarch. Actually, people tend to think of her as a woman who sat around eating cakes and not really doing very much. <laughs> Trying um, to get pregnant. And she certainly did like cakes. She likes not doing very much on times. But actually, I think she is quite underrated as a monarch. She is. The first Queen of Britain, the first monarch of Britain, the Kingdom of Britain is created during her reign. She also settles the succession and it's her act of settlement that re- remains today. So the current monarch, Charles III, reigns by virtue of her act of succession. She basically picks a, a sort of somewhat random Protestant cousin to succeed her. But she's also a really strong character. 
And I think that is underrated. She's People see her as a figure of some pity. She has 17 children and they all die before her. But actually, I think she's a woman who's very focused on winning the crown. And when she does, she actually she makes quite a good job of it. She's quite a good constitutional monarch. And I think people tend to look at her as a bit of a joke when they probably should actually look at Anne as quite a great monarch. And she models herself on Elizabeth I. She actually takes as her motto, Semper Eden, always the same, which is Elizabeth's motto. And that's really what she's trying to achieve. She's trying to create stability in the face of the fact that her dynasty is falling apart. So I think really a, a sort of a shout out for Queen Anne. I would say she's very underrated. We have reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast. Where we ask the same five questions of all of our guests. Dr. Norton, are you ready? I am. What was your first job? I did the teas for the West Sussex Writers Club. It's West Sussex is a small county in southeast England where I grew up. My mother was a children's writer. So I was taken on to do the teas and coffees during the break time. It's a very unique answer. One we will not hear from American historians, I can tell you for <laughs> sure. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Number two, what was your first concert? First concert? It was Jason Donovan. I was about eight, I think, and apparently I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the first concert you remember singing along? Uh, to? First concert I remember. I went to see in the nineties. I went to see Blur, who were very big in the UK. I saw the Manic Street Preachers. So sort of a lot of Brit pop, which was again was very big in the nineteen nineties. So you turn up with your, your sort of your jeans and your, your fluorescent tops and walk <laughs> away. But yeah, so a lot of Brit pop. I don't. I want to say, and forgive me if I get this wrong, Helen Rappaport. Yes. Who's another sweetheart of a podcast. She's guest. I loved her book. Um, I think she said she has the best answer. I think it's almost an unbeatable answer. And that is she saw the Beatles in a pub in 1962. Yeah, I can't beat that. <laughs> I was stunned. In fact, I was yeah. absolutely stunned. I go, what was it like? And she said, we were all screaming. We couldn't hear anything. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Number three. Yeah, I can't beat that. I saw Alanis Morissette last year. I was quite excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Any book. Can I say a trilogy? Because they're in an omnibus. Yes, so ma'am. Okay, the Gorman Gas trilogy by Mervyn Peake, my all-time favorite books. They are fiction. They are he was a friend of Tolkien and also C.S. Lewis, who wrote The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he's the less well known of the three who are sort of Oxford literary group, if you like. They're fabulous. They're set in a fictional castle called Gormenghast, and it's very gothic. And it chants the rise of an anti-hero named Steerpike as he climbs his way through the castle. You possibly have never heard of them. Whenever I say it, no one ever has. But Gormenghast, they're fabulous. All right. This is a tough one. If you could witness any of, maybe it's not a tough one. If you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? I'm going to say, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go with the Tudors, I'm going to say the Field of the Cross of Gold in 1520, which is a great ceremonial piece between Henry VIII and Francis I of France, where they really try and outdo themselves in how peaceful they can be. Um, so they have they, they have a flat pack cathedral, they have golden tents, and there's a fountain that runs with wine, they joust, and they have a wrestling match, actually. Henry challenges Francis to wrestle, and then Francis wins, so it's not mentioned in any of the English sources, but it's all over the French ones. <laughs> um, they even have a dragon, and it's actually depicted in the official English portrait of the Field of the Cross of Gold, this dragon flying across the sky. We don't actually know what the dragon is. It's probably a firework, something like that. They're all adamant that they've got a dragon there. So perhaps it's a bit Game of Thrones, but I'd love to see it. I'd love to go and experience the, the Field of the Cross of Gold. Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, living today, two hours off the record to chat about anything you want, whom would you choose? That's really tough. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's really tough. I don't know. To some extent, I'd want to go and have a chat to the oldest woman in the world. She's a Spanish woman who was born in San Francisco. And just to sort of talk about what her lifetime had been like, because I believe she's about 116. I mean, that's pretty significant. And actually say, any advice? But also, what, what was life like? Because it's 
effectively someone who is historic that you can ask questions of to some extent. Her life goes all the way back to near the start of the 20th century. And I think that would be pretty special and pretty interesting. And again, it fits in. I'm really, what I really like with history and what I'm really interested in is how people lived and how they reacted and how they thought. Because of course, we're all we're all the same. If you took a baby from now and, and put them back 3,000 years ago, they would grow up as a 3,000-year-old baby. There's no difference in, in humans from the past. We're all exactly the same. So it's all about, I would like I like to know how people tick, what's going on in their heads. So I, yeah, I think I would go and meet the oldest woman in the world and have a good chat about what she remembers. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies and Indiana-based Public Relations Enterprise, and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. As always, all our podcast interviews are dedicated to the legacy and generosity of P.E. McAllister. Our guest today has been Dr. Elizabeth Norton. She's a London-based historian. She's got every college degree you could possibly want. She's written fabulous books. And as you can tell from spending some time with us for the last hour, she's delightfully generous with her intellect and a fun, fun conversationalist. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm-hmm.